Well, hey, church, we're going to be receiving communion together at the end of our time here. So go ahead and uh, maybe hit pause, grab a, something to eat or to drink or cracker or a piece of bread there for yourself or later on. So I want to ask you this question. How's your prayer life these days? I mean, if you could ask God for anything, what would it be? You know, I've spoken to many of you over the years about prayer, and some of you have told me this. I have no problem, Pastor, praying for other people, but I feel bad praying for me and asking for me. And where we're called to pray, guys, for other people, it's such a wonderful, important practice to do that. I want to assure you that we also see in the scriptures followers of God all through the ages praying for themselves as well. I want to share with you a prayer that David prayed. This was a prayer prayed by a man after God's own heart. And isn't that what we're trying to do in this series is make sure that our hearts align with God. And here's the thing. Our hearts are not always aligned with God. And sometimes we don't even know it. And we need God to check that for us. And this is at the heart of David's prayer because he knew, man, if I can get this right, if I can just, you know, allow God to really speak deeply into my soul, you know, I can walk better in step with him. So I want to share this with you. I'm excited about this today. It's found in Psalm 139. And David says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? You know, God, examine my heart. Help me address things that need to be addressed very deep within my heart. You know, God knows everything about us and nothing escapes his notice. Earlier in this psalm, David wrote, Oh Lord, you've examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You know everything that I do. And so David willingly asked God to examine his heart for anything offensive and anything sinful. You know, whether it might be a wrong mindset or a practice, he would rather have God do that than suffer the consequences of sin and the hurt that it would bring into his life and to the people that he loves. So he begins, examine my heart. You know, we say people have a good heart all the time, don't we? Oh, that person has such a good heart. Oh, look at how kind they are. Look at how trustworthy they are. But truthfully, nobody has a perfectly good heart, right? Our hearts can be so deceptive at times. They can fool us. The prophet Jeremiah said, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? You might even just go, wow, he said it that way? Jesus himself said, For from the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. You know, we all struggle with our hearts, don't we? As an example, isn't it funny how that we make excuses for ourselves? You know, when other people are late, we judge them, you know, and we think, man, they need to get their life in order. But when we're late, we say, oh, well, the traffic was bad. You know, the dog needed to be walked. I thought I had packed my lunch. I had to go back. I had a phone call. You know, sorry, I'm late. We give ourselves these breaks. And sometimes our hearts are so deceptive that we're unaware of what's going on and where it's eventually taking us in life. So David invites God to examine his heart, to wake him up, to shine a light in his life and say, hey, where am I not quite aligned with you? And then he goes on and he says this, God, I want you to examine my anxious thoughts. You know, this is important because your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. I heard somebody once say they compared a buzzard to a hummingbird, you know, a vulture to a hummingbird. And they said this, you know, Those two birds exist every day and they go about their business every day. One of them is looking for something sweet to eat. The other one is looking for something dead. And here's the thing. They both find what they're looking for. Mm. So what makes you anxious these days? What are your thoughts upon? You know, Researchers tell us that women say that anxiety is the number one issue they deal with these days. And for men, it's number two. Substance abuse is number one, and you could probably connect the dots to how they're related. 
The U.S. is the most anxious of all the countries in the world. 17%, almost one in five, will have an anxiety attack this year. Now, some of this is chemical, but some of this has to do with our hearts. How many of you wake up in the middle of the night and your mind is just whirring and it's turning things over and over and you have this worst case scenario thinking that's going on in your mind, right? The early church leader, Paul, he writes to the church and he says this, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And then he says this, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What's he saying here? We need to identify our thoughts. We need to hold them up to God's truth. And we need to see if they actually really do align with God. See, this world is so upside down these days. It's wreaked havoc on all of us. I'm not exempt. You know, in 2018, before the pandemic, we were working on our building and our campus overhaul. And I'd meet with these builders once or twice a month to go over the details. And at one of the meetings, you know, I just felt so much stress from everything that was going on. The builder said to me, he goes, man, you are nervous. And I told him, I'm always nervous. That's just how I am. I'm like in this state of perpetual anxiety. But the thing is, is back in 2018, I could generally be able to control that. You know, I can manage that in my life. But since this pandemic has gone through, I have found anxiousness would just increase in my life and it was way harder to manage. I ended up having to get some help for it. And I was trying to find out what's going on in my life. And so after some digging, you know, with, with my counselor, I found that my acceptance and how I viewed life was tied so closely to productivity and performance. It was a shame. You know, I'm, I, was, I was so into solving and overcoming problems and finding my peace that way. So when a global pandemic hit and the church was dispersed and racial tensions grew and economic pressure, you know, heated up, and then we had these divisive elections and the world changed and I was faced with massive problems that I could no longer fix anymore. Man, I came to an end of myself. I really did. And many of you did too. And I remember one of the things that counselor said to me through this whole process is he says, you know, Andy, it seems like you're trying to comfort your own soul through your productivity, through your problem solving, and you can't. Comfort doesn't come from outcomes. That was so important for me to hear. So my heart was attuned to that. What is your heart attuned to these days? How about whatever that thing is that's in your life that you want to control that's out of your control? How about allowing God to try at your heart and let him be your comforter instead of trying to do it your own way? You know, I love this passage of scripture that was shared with me. And he said to me, uh, the, the Bible says this, God is our merciful father and he is the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. And even when we're weighed down with troubles, it's for your comfort and salvation. That's interesting. It's the way that we'll experience the comfort of God. So here's what I was faced with. Where I'm most anxious is usually where I'm trusting God the least in my life. And when my anxiousness is high, it's a red flag for me and maybe for you that the trust level in God is low. That's why Peter wrote to the church and he said, you have to give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. Not only is he great, he's good. He loves you. But most of us aren't really good at that, are we? We cast our worries and cares upon ourselves. And so maybe it would do us well to stop in our prayer with to God, single these worries out and pray through the promises and character of God and allow God to comfort your soul. You know, David prays, show me my anxious thoughts because I want you to comfort me because you're the one who's in control. So it's not just a God and us relationship too. It's a, we're social beings. It's us and people as well. And we need to live our lives with people. And we need to include people in our lives. And we need to invite people into our lives. 
And one of the greatest ways we can reduce anxiety as well is by actually serving people, to be able to put ourselves in a situation where our focus isn't entirely on us, but on others. Matter of fact, observational studies and research have indicated that those who are regularly engaged in volunteering tend to be subsequently happier. You know, they tend to have more social activities with people. They have better physical and mental health, and they also live longer. And so it's so important for us to have our hearts aligned with God, but also to be giving our lives to others. Now, another thing that David prays is to show me my sins. You know, where am I behaving wrongly? David asked God. Maybe it's in our careless words that we speak or the tone of voice that we carry. We're all on edge these days. Maybe it's a lack of forgiveness or maybe it's just self-centeredness, watching out for yourself above everybody else. You know, it's amazing the excuses that we come up with, right? It's everybody else's problems, not ours. But if you have no clue of where your heart is not aligned with God, maybe you should start asking him, you know? Here's a way we can do this. You can start by just asking God, God, you know, God, what are you telling me? And, and we ask this question, what is God telling me? He'll nudge your heart. He's always nudging your heart. What's God telling me? Answer that question today. Then you might want to ask, what are other people telling me? And see if there's any convergence with these two things in your life. And then here's a good question to ask. Where am I most defensive? Hmm. Chances are there's an issue right there. So follow God. He finally says that he wants to follow God in a new direction. You know, the first parts that David prayed, he's asking God to examine and to expose all these destructive patterns in his life, these thought patterns. But now he's asking God for, with that change of heart, I want a change and I need a change of direction. So will you lead me so that I can follow? So finally today, I just want to ask you, what action will you take? When God nudges your heart, when he awakens something within you that says, this is not quite aligned with me, what are you going to do about it? Let's just get real frank. What if you have a greedy heart? right? You're like, man, I'm just, I have the scarcity mindset. I'm holding on too hard to everything. I'm not open-handed. Maybe you can pray, God, change my heart by leading me to generosity. You know, give me opportunities. Help me to be aware of those. Or maybe you have an impure heart. We don't all have these perfect hearts. Change my heart, God, by leading me to pure and to true thoughts. You know, help me to shut some things down, to, to move my mind in a different direction, God. Lead and guide us me that way. Maybe it's the anxiousness we talked about. God, change my heart. Lead me to a pathway of peace, understanding that you're in control, not me. The question is, how are you going to walk with God through the next week? I think a good way to start this week is through communion. Communion has always been a time for us to really celebrate what Jesus has done, by recalibrating our hearts toward him. We get misaligned just like our cars do and we can start drifting to one side or the other. It's so important for us to take this time to confess just like David did, to align our hearts with God, to invite him into our lives, to shine a light on our soul. And as we prepare to receive communion, maybe your prayer could be exactly like David's. God, search my heart. Examine my anxious thoughts, show me my sins, and lead me in a better way.